Um, thanks for being here. Uh, this is Entrepreneurship 101, the workshop. Um, we put on a number of workshops here in the Innovation Lab. Um, over the course of this year, you can expect 75 to 80 really uh, skill-based workshops where we try to get very practical and very real around a variety of topics or a variety of subject areas. The, the, the common thread of all of them, though, is we're trying to communicate things that are really practical and are going to assist you in the journey of taking ideas you may have or ideas you're looking to generate that may turn into projects or ventures that you try to grow, that we can create these workshops to be resources to you so that you can equip yourself to take them as far as they can and should go. So this is one of many things we'll talk about, um, about that are resources to you. For tonight's workshop, you can expect uh, really three things that we want to cover with you. One is, uh, and I keep saying we, and I'm going to introduce Jody Goldstein, my colleague, in a moment, but um, there's three things we're going to cover. One is, there's, um, this is called Entrepreneurship 101 because there's a presumption that you're uh, either really inclined towards entrepreneurship, you're really interested in this area, but you may not have much history, uh, much experience, or you're really interested, you, you may have more experience than that, but you're just really interested in what some of the foundational insights or foundational thoughts are from those of us who are running the iLab. So I'm presuming you're one of those, one of those two groups tonight. Um, if not, enjoy a, a soda and a piece of pizza and, and uh, hopefully enjoy what you're going to hear. So there's three things we're going to cover off here. One is there's a lot of interesting research and I think this is an important workshop to kick off the school year with. I've done this once before last year and I'm doing it again at the beginning of the term because I think it's really important that we um, take a moment and step back and say, hey, what is this journey of entrepreneurship? What's the data tell us about entrepreneurship? And there's five things I cover within that first area that I think really is pretty enlightening to what the journey of entrepreneurship looks like. But it's a lot about data and what research, and I'm, I'm leveraging a lot of Ernst & Young's research on entrepreneurs. Second area is going to be taught by Jody, and it really gets more practical around 10 things every aspiring entrepreneur should know, and I'm going to let Jody again talk more about her background and what she does. And the third thing is we want to make sure you leave here knowing what are the things I can get connected to the Innovation Lab and or the resources that are available to me here at Harvard. Most of you, I presume, are Harvard students. It's, it was really a targeted for our university audience here at Harvard. Um, so we want to cover off what are the things that are available to you. Those are the three things. Before I get started any further, can I just show a hands? How many folks are coming from the college? Okay, it's a good number. Um, uh, GSAS. Um, let's see, other schools. The law school, ed school. Okay, good component of ed school. Um, graduate school of design, folks. Okay, anybody from the medical or dental school? Okay. Um, and am I missing a school? What school? Divinity? Kennedy, I'm sorry. Jeez, I should have had that one. Kennedy, that's also another good, um, good participation. Okay, terrific. Um, I'm sorry. Yeah, business school. <laughs> Who? What? What's the business school? Never heard of that. Um, you know, one. Of, I think I think that was the wrong thing for me to lead down because, quite honestly, we're governed by ten of the uh, deans here at Harvard. So you're putting me on the spot to remember right off the cuff. Um, so apologies to uh, Business and Kennedy. So a little bit of an intro. Um, I am Gordon Jones, Managing Director of the Innovation Lab. Um, I also, we're being taught here, I think this is on a play screen. Um, Jody Goldstein is my colleague, Director of the iLab. And um, Jody and I really represent a lot of the leadership when it comes to um, our work within the university, the various programming we do. Jody spends a lot of time and effort, and I give her a ton of credit for the, the workshops, the mentorship, a lot of the programming that's designed, and the uh, partnerships we do with the innovation community. Jody has a very robust uh, personal history as an entrepreneur that she'll give you in a moment. From my standpoint, um, I also come out of industry. I've been um, with four different startups in my past. Um, I've also done a lot of work within larger organizations, more as an intrapreneur. And um, I've also been an educator as well. I've been an adjunct lecturer at a different university. Um, 
But um, all of that's been in the physical goods space, so phys consumer products, uh, pest control, hardware. So I come more from a physical space. Jody, I think it's safe to say a little more of the, the, tech, the tech mobile space. Um, I think it's a real compliment when we look around the university. There's a lot of different interests that span these, uh, these areas. Uh, Neil Doyle is the third person in this picture. Neil is the manager of operations. He manages all of the facility, the technology to support this facility that we'll cover off. He's also an integral member of the leadership team here and someone you ought to get to know if you don't already. So I like to lead off with a few quotes because this really helps set some of the stage. Um, and I've pulled these. These, these are easily uh, searchable on Google, but um, I think they reflect something and I'll go through them. One is Thomas Watson saying, I believe there's a world market for maybe five computers back in 1943, one of the founders of IBM. Um, Western Union, talking about the shortcomings of this thing called the telephone. Um, can't be seriously considered as a means of communication. It inherently has no value. Um, Henry Warner of Warner Brothers Films in 1927 saying, who the hell wants to hear actors talk? Uh, one of the threads that you're seeing here, and you'll hear this from other entrepreneurs who talk, these are folks who in their day are experts. If you'd gone to meet someone at Western Union or if you had sat down with Harry Warner, um, you'd be sitting amidst, amidst someone who you would have had a lot of respect for in that day. They knew that industry, they knew that business. And um, while it's clear that they were off the mark with some of their guests, and I have a few more quotes here as well, I think what's important is you're going to be, in, in the pursuit of your own ideas, you're going to be looking to speak with individuals who also represent the kind of expertise that in their day these people did. And I think it's important that we bring a level of uh, interest and respect because these folks do have interesting insight. At the same time, too often in many students I see pattern recognition, you may treat those individuals as having truth or that they really are validators of my own ideas. And I think we're going to talk about a common characteristic in entrepreneurs that data talks about that's a, that shows you, you'll need to persevere through some folks who may have a different point of view and are still considered experts. So there's no magic formula there, but it is interesting and hopefully these kind of uh, quotes illustrate with a little more time perspective, how uh, somebody who might have gotten advice from Henry Warner in 1927 about their new idea to have sound incorporated with moving pictures, um, they might actually have been right and he was wrong. Um, this is a famous one, um, Lord Kelvin talking about heavier than air flying machines are impossible. Uh, more, more recently, the founder of 3M talking about how if he had um, thought about it more, he wouldn't have done the experiment that led him to discovering the adhesive that made up 3M's uh, post-it notes. The literature is full of examples, said you can't do this. Um, so with that, and before I get into the data, I'll just say um, innovation is something that, uh, I like this description, it comes from a colleague over at MIT, and I wanted to share it with you. Um, innovation, it should be cultivated, entrepreneurship can be taught. If you think about the two, um, the two words, innovation, it's really about the invention um, the, there's somewhere in there is a unique insight, whether that's a scientific definition of, in, of innovation, if you're interested in the health and the sciences, your, your invention may be more of an insight into something that's an idea. But it's ultimately invention that gets combined with commercialization. Your ability, and commercialization is not, some of you in this audience may be more um, um, not focused on necessarily making a million bucks and retiring to an island. I don't, I don't know, you know, sometimes you daydream about that, but the reality is commercialization is more about the, com the comment about bringing forward your idea to a greater audience. And if you have that invention and you're then able to commercialize it, bring it out to a broader audience, um, that's where real innovation can take place. Um, so there's a lot of inventors out there and there's a lot of people who commercialize, but when you bring the two together is where you get innovation. Innovation itself doesn't tell you much, and I don't want to get too academic, it doesn't necessarily describe how disruptive your, or the impact that you, your innovation has, but it needs to have those two components, and I thought that was really, really helpful. Um, entrepreneurship, we think of that as a set of skills, that's industry knowledge, practice, it's, um, it's ultimately that individual who's able to apply and carry forward that innovation. Um, so what are the goals for my part of talking about this data? I want to set context for you. If there's one thing that my piece of this talk does, I want to set context because, again, you're all at a place in time. You may have individual friends who are, you think are uh, uh, aspiring, you aspire to be like, they're further along in their, 
interest as entrepreneurs and you're kind of saying, hmm, I want to get going, um, I want to put some data around that. So I want to set context around what it means to be an entrepreneur. I want to inform you on what do successful entrepreneurs look like. Um, hopefully teach you to look at new, uh, new ways as a, at a career in entrepreneurship. Um, and we'll talk about ways that the Innovation Lab can assist you. And, and ultimately, I hope this is an uplifting workshop. It's designed to hopefully give you the sense that, gosh, you know, there's not any one formulaic path to it, but there are some key insights and principles that can be used to being an entrepreneur. So our agenda, I want to review this report on entrepreneurship. This really is relying on research Ernst & Young does. They've, um, it's the 2011 report. They work with 800 entrepreneurs around the world, and they really try to distill key insights into what makes these entrepreneurs successful and what is it that makes them unique. And then we'll talk about the 10 things that every aspiring entrepreneur should, should know, and then their iLab. So what are the key findings? I like to get right to the point. So rather than try to progressively reveal, I'll just tell you those five key findings. One is that entrepreneurs are made, they're not born. Phew. You know, unless there's a few of you who felt like you were just born, ready. And maybe, there, maybe you do. There's certainly some who feel that calling early. But there are characteristics that you can do to help develop yourself as an entrepreneur. Second of all is entrepreneurship is rarely a one-off decision. There's a lot of practice that goes into it and the data that really shows that working as an entrepreneur and doing this, you can actually develop yourself so that it's not just a random thought that turns into an idea and you just had it and you were born an entrepreneur. Um, it's, there's a lot of work you can do to develop expertise. There were three key um, barriers to entrepreneurial success that were identified, funding, people, and know-how. And I think there's some interesting insights that come from that. Entrepreneurs do share common traits when you look at the personality types. Um, Ernst & Young calls out. And then lastly, for those of you who might say, boy, this entrepreneurial thing's interesting, but how, how can I be an entrepreneur within larger organizations? Or what things can large organizations learn from entrepreneurship? There's some insights as well that come from this research. Let me jump into it. Entrepreneurial leaders are made, not born. Um, there is no entrepreneurship gene. I, uh, when you look at these entrepreneurs around the world, um, about half, over half of entrepreneurs actually start being entrepreneurs after the age of 30. So again, hopefully, for those of you who have friends who've uh, you know, gone off to be Teal Fellows or are um, already on their way, you may say, okay, Half people don't even start the journey of being an entrepreneur. Why is that? I think there's three things that go into being an entrepreneur. I think it's a skill set. It's an inclination to, um, you, to, to basically, um, it's some form of expertise you deploy. It's a skill set. And it's um, a, ri a sense of r a risk profile. And I think my two cents on top of this data is, for many people, it takes time to develop um, the insight. I don't see a lot of your peers, medical school excluded, who walk through the door from the college saying, you know what, I got this new idea for a cranium drill. I'm going to corner the market for a cranium drill. You know, why is that? It's because you probably haven't been in an operating room or really thought through um, you know, what are the issues that need to be addressed to identify a more superior cranium drill. I don't see a lot of business-to-business -to -business telephony solutions coming from students. So there's certain areas you'll develop expertise and insight as you go along, and I think my commentary on this is that that may be one of the contributing factors is that some individuals it just takes some more time before they start to develop that level of expertise. Um, I think the, the opposite of what I'm saying or is don't worry if you don't have your idea right now. Don't feel like you've missed the boat if the place and time where you are today um, makes you feel like I don't have that idea, I don't have that team, I haven't yet launched and I haven't yet received my Series A funding. Um, just you know, ultimately, this is a long journey, and, um, and I think the data tells us that, that that's hopefully reassuring. Um, more than half of entrepreneurs are transitioned from employees. I think this reinforces my earlier point about expertise, that um, oftentimes working for experience, if, if you don't feel like you have coming out of this school experience, that key idea or that area you're extremely passionate about, some folks do find there's value in being a more traditional employee, um, and the data talks about this. And again, my belief is that that's about developing expertise. A lot of people um, 
ultimately roll out of companies with new insights and they have expertise to go commercialize those. It's really analogous to where you are as students today. We see a lot of students coming out of classes where you've just come out of a course where you've had a project you've been working on or you've had something that's a, a team you've formed and a lot of those students come out ready to now work as a team. They've built familiarity with each other, they've built an idea. So, that's really the, um, the corollary to what many folks are doing in the marketplace. Um, and thirdly, there was an entrepreneur who said, I was brought up in an entrepreneurial family, but I became a chartered accountant and then a banker. So there's also a component and a thread here from data that says some people are very deliberate about going out and seeking experiences that will inform them being entrepreneurs. So I want to, what does that all mean in the end is you may be someone who ends up choosing between now and being a, an entrepreneur and stepping into this, someone who takes a more traditional role. And, and, and I guess the underlying point there is do it for a purpose, that you're developing some deliberate skill. Try to be choiceful in what that is if you think that you want to ultimately end up in some entrepreneurial endeavor. So that's point one. Um, when, or that's the second part to part one is the, the reported success factors. So when they surveyed these entrepreneurs and said, what are the things that made you successful? Ironically, they said experience as an employee. Again, we believe that's because you're developing expertise. Two was higher education and three was mentors. I'm going to jump right to the second point. The bottom three factors, investors, friends, and C-level executives and your board. I'm going to start on the second point, then I'll come back to the first. A lot of people presume that you know, um, these three, the investors, friends, and, and uh, members of their board are the ones who inform how they should be developing their business or their idea. Data here says those are actually the three, um, the bottom three that are reported as helpful. Why is that? Oftentimes your friends, what are they telling you? They're telling you what you want to hear, not so much the ob objective perspective they have. I've seen this in my own experience. I'll hand somebody, a, you name it, a product, or you put somebody online to try your, your service, they're going to tell you most often they're biased and you're getting biased answers. People don't really always, very rarely will they do what they say. In my world, I've been in physical goods and services. I've put a lot of products in front of people from toothbrushes to women's razors to mosquito prevention devices. And virtually all of them, if you put something meaningfully thoughtful in front of them, if they know you, they're going to want you to feel good. They'll be like, oh, that's a great product, Gordon, man. I know how hard you, you know, in their minds they're saying, I know how hard you worked. What they're telling me is that, yeah, of course I'd buy it. And, you know, you got to know and over time to either develop really insightful ways to get your friends to give you more objective feedback or you ultimately need to turn to other less biased ways. I think on the top reported factors, um, the experience you're getting as an employee, education. You know, we all have our own ideas. I don't have any one key insight into this. I do think, though, that the, 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 um, the learning that does take place in the classroom over time, especially in a liberal arts center of gravity world of Harvard, it's a pretty rich platform to draw upon. I can't tell you how studying geology today is going to inform what you're doing 10 years from now, but you never know. And I've seen in my own life um, how I have taken different classes, and at times it'll, the craziest things will pop up. It could be serendipitous or it could actually be meaningfully insightful to the product you're doing, or it could be something very serendipitous. Um, and mentorship, I think this one is key. It's something that I know, Jody, you've worked hard to develop here, and it's something that's really com a key component to resources that are available to, to individuals um, in residence here in the iLab. We do think that that's a really critical experience, that you have someone who's partnering with you to help you develop your idea in an advisory capacity, in a mentoring capacity. Third point here is value the big organization or corporate work for the experience and training. The catch is, and this is a point I want to make, the longer you stay, the harder it is to leave. So this is back to my point about working for experience rather than for the money. I have more friends who over our 20s and 30s talked all about at lunch in the larger organizations I've been with about all the things we were going to do, and they're still there. And they keep telling me, man, I love what you've done or what you're doing. Oh, I can't wait. I just need my idea. I just need this. I just need that. The problem is every year they stay, what's going on? Somebody? Yeah, you're getting raises. You know what they're having? They're, they're starting families. They're, 
finding that their obligations in life start to expand. And you know what? Now all of a sudden the opportunity cost to leave gets higher and higher. So opportunity, just the cost of leaving get higher. I mean, if I, my first job out of college, I taught high school math for $14,000 a year. There was a lot of jobs and a lot of entrepreneurial activity people could have offered me and I'd have taken it because I was giving up $14,000, okay? Um, maybe, let's say I was making more than that 10 years later, which I was, it's gonna be a lot harder to ultimately, I'm now looking at those opportunities. Let's just be honest, it's tough. So when you get in, you know, you'll stay, it gets comfortable. You know what, I know the drill. Yeah, I really did want to get out. I kind of liken it. This is my own personal analogy. St stick with me. If you don't like it, I apologize. Working in bigger organizations is a little bit like um, what I imagine it must be like to be an animal in a zoo. Okay? You know, Three, three times a day they come around, they drop some food for you, maybe you're a tiger, you know, it's, they drop some meat, you know, once a month some guy shows up and gives me shots and makes sure I'm healthy. And my job is when the family comes by, I'm supposed to roar, you know. And I know the drill, you know, it's easy. And, um, and I think that it'd be really tough after 20 years in the zoo to be let go in the middle of, I don't know, Camp Chatka if I'm a Siberian tiger and know what to do, know where to go, and yet Again, I'm, I'm layering a lot of what I imagine it's like to be a Siberian tiger, but you know, if you're in the wild, I'm assuming you, know, you may not know where your next meal comes from, but you know where you want to go. You're able to start to identify what, you know, where food may be, what great vistas you want to go look out after. It's just it's a different species in the end. Um, and you become that which the environment in which you're a part of, I guess, is the ultimate point. And this is really speaks to the third point. You know, getting in and learning a little bit is great, but if you stay too long, your opportunity costs get to be high. So entrepreneurs are not um, born, they're made. Entrepreneurship is rarely a one-off decision. So this really is about being a career decision. There's a career here and a career choice. And I think the iLab as an organization is really designed to try to represent to you a place where you can find the resources if this is the kind of career you might want to step into or explore. So one of the things we find is that really a small subset of entrepreneurial leaders create the majority of startups. Um, the data here has 10% of entrepreneurs starting between a quarter and almost a third of new businesses. One in five start one in two new businesses. What does that tell me? That tells me that you develop expertise in doing this. If you start to get into this as a profession, you're gonna become, you're gonna find out quickly if you have what it takes but you'll find that there is, there is a learning curve and there is expertise that gets developed. You're gonna hear from an, several entrepreneurs who are quoted here towards the end of this. Um, and many of them are, are multi-time, multiple time entrepreneurs and there's that expertise they develop. Um, some of the data, if you're interested, there's this concept of, you know, some, some of you may find as you get started in this or you know people, there's a trap of sort of a uh, a grow and kill. Um, there's individuals who are kind of unwilling to ultimately let go, and I've seen this here in the iLab. We've had 165 student teams in our first year come through in our residency program. And like many startups, many, multiples of those, Jody and I have counseled, seen break up, and one of the threads we see is that there's often individuals who really are so passionate that they actually hold too tight to their startup and they hold so tight that they don't, they're so committed to their vision of what this startup is gonna look like that they really don't invite others in. When you're on that team, you know, you're what, what we see develop over time is that there's a real brittleness that founder brings and they end up constraining the growth of it. They effectively kill it and many of these will fail because they're, um, they're ultimately um, holding too tight to it to allow others to join in and really feel like partners in the growth. And you start to feel like this is really somebody else's show. And I've had, I'm thinking of one team in particular I won't mention, but it's just really difficult. A number of team members ultimately fell off because I said, gosh, I really want to help, but person X or person Y, just it's really their show. And you start to see talent falling off rather than coming around and coalescing around. Um, and um, 
I guess the last point, I'm going to skip point three and go to four, only a small core of entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial leaders make a successful transition from startup to mature company. This is interesting because it's, uh, it's the opposite. There's, at the same time, you're going to learn. Entrepreneurs are very talented, but you'll develop, uh, hopefully, insight if you are, do become an entrepreneur into what stage you're really good at. Some people are really good at spinning up and getting a venture just started on traction. And then it's important for them to realize actually the skills required to grow an organization continually change and evolve as that organization grows. What it takes to be leading a startup that is now growing at $25 million in revenue is very different than someone who's got a million dollars in revenue. Um, and those skills ultimately require greater um, scaling and structured thinking. Pro process starts to work its way into the organization. Um, how you actually think about your business is very different. And so I can only think of one person I know who grew a startup um, from two co-founders to now I think it's a $5 billion a year revenue company. And the individual, one of the two co-founders has stayed with that company from the beginning. It started as a, um, it's called Roadside Rescue. And it started as a, um, a, a little business that would uh, kind of almost like AAA, the car service if, you, if your car breaks down. It's a service that came through your credit card for free. And that company has changed so much since Roadside Rescue. Um, it, it ultimately got in, they started to realize, well, we're selling this service. We can actually also start to um, expand it into batteries. They got into battery repair for a lot of mobile devices. Then they got into actually insurance. They would sell you insurance. So you go to Best Buy and buy a TV now and they'll offer you a nine, 12 month extended warranty. This business has changed so much over time. It's very, very special that when somebody could actually stick with it. I think it's one of the most rarest birds to find. So think more about, you know, as much as you can grow and kill, you got to also know where your own limits lie and when you need to hand off. Um, three, funding people and know-how are the biggest barriers to entrepreneurial success. So um, access to capital was the number one reported um, biggest issue. Uh, so funding people and know-how. Um, there's an interesting um, formula. I sat with a VC when I started this job uh, 18 almost 18 months ago. And he said to me, um, um, G Gordon, he said, you know, you want to know what, how I think about business, uh, startups and, and entrepreneurs. I think of, uh, and he gave me a formula. He said, GF plus GI plus, what is it, T, BT for trajectory equals F. I said, well, okay, unpackage that for me. And he said, well, good founder, plus good idea, plus trajectory, meaning up, you're growing, you're, you're growing your idea, you've got people adopting it, equals funding. He goes, you need two out of those three to, to interest my business in funding you. And I promise you, unless you are well known and have started multiple startups, it's not GF. So it better be GI plus trajectory if you're, most of you presumably in this in this room. And that's not a sign of disrespect or dismissiveness. Don't misread that. I think it's just more a sense of people who are putting a lot of other people's money into ideas are actually fairly risk averse. And they want to know that you're on to something. And they'll either bank on your name if you're well known because you've done it before and people know that. Or they can point to the metrics of your idea and your trajectory. So. Um, think about that equation as you think about access to funding. Well, there's, that's something you'll come across as you, as you go through your journey. But um, think of these three things um, when you think about funding people and know-how. So entrepreneurial leaders need to choose between being rich and being king. Noam Wasserman, Harvard Business School students here, you may have Noam uh, or you'll be able to choose Noam your second year. Um, he talks a lot about, he does extensive research on startups. He talks a lot about this dichotomy and this choice. It's a little bit related to my point about leaders who hold on too tight. Do you want to be rich or do you want to be a king? Is what he says. And he says, if you want to be king, you're going to ultimately pursue the, um, you're, going to, you're going to so pursue your dream, you, you, you have to be prepared that you may not reach full scale because you're not always going to attract the most talented people to come to your idea if you are committed to 100% of your idea coming to fruition. And again, he's not using the word rich or king in, in a, in, he's a very broad ecumenical definition of that. His point is, is if you want to be rich, meaning you want to see your idea really blossom, 
be willing to, you know, would you rather get 80% of your idea and the impact you're looking to have, but take it globally? Or would you rather see, you know, you're just so demand that your idea is right, that it has to be embodied in your idea. Be prepared for folks that you're not going to ultimately be able to scale it as big. That's what he's observed with the data, and he's written a whole book on it. We had a whole book uh, launch with him here last year. It's a really interesting um, um, dichotomy. The second point about, um, about people, finding people. Skills are difficult to find, but peop finding people with the right values is even harder. When you're in a startup, you've got to, at the early point, have a team that can work well together. So yes, you need to have, uh, so many of you want to find either individuals with an engineering background or a specific science background, or you're looking for somebody who's got credentials in education or medicine or in other areas. Um, that's important. But if you're not working well as a team, I use the iLab. The iLab itself is a startup in a sense. It happens to be a startup within a very large organization, being Harvard. We're a four-person team. Our days are very crazy, but we really are very complementary in our skill sets. We get along well, and when things, when, the, when things are really hopping here, and we have, we're up to our eyeballs, I know, and I believe my team all knows, we lean into each other. We actually implicitly trust each other and we really enjoy ultimately working together at hours that you know, um, uh, will often be very odd and, and different than most other employees to Harvard University. And we've replicated that in other teams, and I've been on some teams that were awful. I mean, I've been, in, I've been on one startup, this was an Inc. Magazine fastest growing company, and I sat and my jaw almost hit the ground as I watched a fight almost break out between our lawyer and our chief scientist. Um, not the kind of environment that was that healthy and ultimately it was a sign of a lot of corrosive behavior in the organization. It didn't, the organization by the way didn't succeed um, uh, after doing very well early on. But um, that people with the right values, they're people who tend to be rowing in the same direction as you and it's a real important point. Um, I'll make one point on this and I want to, I want to hustle this along because I think that, I think uh, there's a great list coming here with, with Jody sharing some applied things. But I just say entrepreneurs do share core traits. They really share a sense that they control their destiny um, or they, they have an internal locus of control, they call it. It's a belief that your actions lead to outcomes, okay? Not that external forces control. And this is really interesting because it's, um, there's going to be times when, when ultimately, um, you may not see things as having opportunity. You think the economy is down, you think that you know, this is a really difficult time. It's the entrepreneur will often have a viewpoint which is, um, that's great, that's great, but let me move on to, you know, I know that I believe I can actually drive an outcome here. I'm not overly, in, you know, gosh, it, it, you know, it's been terrible the last month, you know, our, our business is weather dependent, and, you know, it's just, there's a sense of fatalism that is not what I think entrepreneurs bring. And the research they, they talk about really brings that forward. Um, they also see opportunity where others see disruption. Again, this speaks to people's risk tolerance, um, to their willingness to, um, to ultimately see opportunity where others see disruption. And I think it's pretty self-explanatory, that viewpoint. So my hope here is you're thinking about this through your own lenses. Where do you fit on this? How would you rate yourself as you think about these components? You don't have to know it all. This is not a, I'm not trying to create um, a, a, um, a declaring yourself as either fitting that or not, but just in your own mind, think about, hey, how do I match up to that? What is it? And you may watch yourself evolve over time, or you may be aware. I meet a lot of people on this risk aversion. I think it's one that, that, that often will trip a lot of us up. There's times that I've made choices that have been more uh, risk averse than risk seeking. So I don't want you to think that, oh, we're finished products, but I do think that that's one I've seen a lot of students, and you yourselves, because you're facing a lot of choices as graduates from this university, or if you're from another university, you've got choices. There's no doubt about it. I believe that this is a group of very high achieving and individuals who really want to make an impact. So um, you're going to ultimately, if you choose this path, forego a fair amount of upfront salary or cash if you choose to step into it right away. And I think it's this, um, this willingness to basically have a confidence in yourself and ultimately have a level of, of willingness to take on risk. The reward comes that if you can grow it, you can ultimately either see your idea come to fruition 
If there's a commercial and a for-profit side, you may see a financial return that's disproportionate to, um, or that is proportionate to your risk you've taken on. But I think that's important to be aware of. And then I, I do want to acknowledge there's cultural influences here. The United States is a very, uh, as a culture, is very supportive of this kind of environment of trying. Um, f failure is, is in many cases, um, uh, at times celebrated. Uh, certainly it's not something that people wear as shameful. I think there are certain cultures where either structurally the, or the country is set up that it's more difficult to practice being an entrepreneur. Laws may, um, may prevent you from writing off a, a, bad, a bad business. In the United States, if you set up as, a, as an entity that's separate from you as an individual, that entity fails, you move on. The, the government has set up a system that supports you taking those risks without feeling like you're putting yourself in any financial harm for long term. Um, you may be in a culture where just more culturally it's something that is difficult to do. It, pe people don't necessarily look upon taking risk as uh, something that's positive. It may be something you're risking. Uh, you may be in more of a community culture where that brings um, some level of discomfort to, to those who identify with you. So I acknowledge that, um, and those are factors that also you need to be thinking about if those ap apply to you. And then lastly, um, there's a lot traditional companies can learn. And, and if, for those of you who are looking at, at uh, large organizations, meritocracies, you're going to hear a lot of companies, if you do go to other career uh, nights, talking about the meritocracy, and we give you all the responsibility you can handle, and you can show us what you can do. You know, Try to really, if, you're, if you are evaluating those as two different options, try to really push through that marketing speak and try to ask really what is, what, how are people rewarded? Is there, a, is there a career path for people who want to be intrapreneurs? Um, you know, I've done that track. I don't see too many organizations, even the ones that are celebrated in all the magazines and the press as being progressive and new organizations and structures. Um, very often, it's very difficult to be an entrepreneur. You're very self, uh, you're a very lonely existence, much like being an entrepreneur. There's not a career path that's designed for you. Um, and I think that if you end up do going into a more large organization, how can you be that, that, that uh, manager or that individual who can support innovation taking place within established organizations? So I think that there's a lot that companies can learn from what entrepreneurial leaders are doing today. So my hope, this is, um, concludes my section. I've got a couple quotes and then I'll hand it over to Jody, but I just say my hope is that this sets a little bit of perspective for you, okay? If you're under 30, you don't have your idea, don't worry about it, you know. Obviously, keep working at it. What are the characteristics that go into um, finding teams and involved with people? This whole rich versus king concept. Play with these ideas. Think about how they may apply with you. I've intentionally talked at about a 10,000 foot level here. We're a very applied place here in the iLab. So this is one of the few workshops where I'm really trying to more set context for you and kind of paint the background of the canvas. Um, a lot of what we do here is more focused on how do you actually get going and putting your ideas into practice. So I leave you with these three um, quotes. I asked three successful entrepreneurs to just kind of share what would the wisdom or the perspective they would say looking back on their career. John McNeil is his fourth startup. He actually, uh, since he wrote this, he's named Ernst & Young's Entrepreneur of the Year in the Northeast. He's on his fourth startup here. He's done uh, three very different previous startups. But he talks about the leap is a lot less scary than it looks. Um, I was really intimidated to take a leap from a great job, great career path, steer off in a direction very different from his classmates. Think about that point about opportunity cost we talked about. And John didn't go to graduate school. All his friends did. I've known John for 20 years. In a word, he, he, it was risk he was facing. I spent too much time churning on the potential downsides before taking the leap and launching a business. As it turned out, most of the negatives, income, income, impact, income, income impact, failure risk, isolation, they all turned out to be more than manageable. Ultimately, the thrill of uh, being a serial entrepreneur, four startups, his case for good outcomes. Uh, later, I can't imagine doing anything else. John Brent Kleeman, uh, Kleiman, went to HBS. He talks about two pieces of advice. The only reason a startup fails is it runs out of cash. Don't run out of cash. Sounds simple, but don't get caught up in the spending hype. You can be really creative uh, in a more budgetary fashion. 
Don't waste your time. I, I like this one a lot personally. Don't waste your time or money building a product people don't want to buy. Get a group of target customers, not friends or family. Back to slide two or three. Stay close to them. Work with them. Build out your business. Um, if they don't want to help you with an idea, it might not be worth your time since they didn't feel enough pain to work on something. So if you think these people are perfect partners, they don't want to work with you, really ask yourself why. Why wouldn't they? I think this is a great solution for them. Why, why aren't they willing to? What's the issue? And then lastly, Antonio Rodriguez. Antonio started and sold a company um, in the late 90s. For those of you that were um, studied that bubble or been a part of it, that was a very frenetic time. A lot of activity with startups and then the bubble burst in 2000. So he talks about, I wish I'd known that being an entrepreneur is a career choice and um, that as such you want to have a bunch of experiences. He sold his first startup really quickly. Thank you, 1999. That was his reference to the bubble. I assume the whole thing was a more of a hit-based lottery process. It took another six years for me to learn that there are actually skills and connections that you grow better by taking the long view. So I share those with you, um, and now I'll turn it over to Jody to talk about 10 things you should know. OK, can you hear me? Am I too loud? Um, that was really great. I actually learned a lot. And you know, as I was thinking about it, as you were presenting it, a lot of what you're um, talking about really resonated with me in my career. Um, but hindsight is such a beautiful thing. I didn't know I wanted to be an entrepreneur starting out. Uh, so what I was going to do today, I have absolutely no data to support anything I'm saying. It's purely my personal experience as an entrepreneur. So take it with a grain of salt. Um, I find that uh, I'm good at being an entrepreneur, but not so good at teaching it. Um, but I will share with you my personal experiences and you can do with it what you want. Um, so just a bit of background. I did not set out to be an entrepreneur. I graduated from undergrad with I think it was an international business degree because I like to travel. And I took a job that um, would enable me to travel. It was uh, at General Electric, one of the biggest companies in the world, how ironic. And um, I liked it because every three months they'd plot me in a new GE business and I'd get to see the world and be on expense account and learn a lot in a really short period of time. So I took that job and I had a ball and I had no idea I wanted to be an entrepreneur. Um, and I did that for a couple years and then I started looking around at the, my boss and my boss's boss and their boss and what I was supposedly aspiring to be and realized I didn't really want those jobs. And um, to take Gordon's analogy, uh, you know, it, I don't think I was the tiger that was willing to roar when someone told me to roar. Um, I kind of wanted to control my own destiny and uh, didn't like being told what to do and often got into trouble by executing on something without asking permission. And I was told on numerous occasions that I was, I was too direct and I was too honest and I should really, you know, be more political and I wasn't really good at that kind of stuff. So anyway, um, I decided to leave the corporate world and uh, I went into venture capital. So I thought it would be really interesting to learn about both the investment side and also the startup side of the world because uh, I didn't really know what I wanted to do next, but it sounded like a kind of a cool opportunity. And I did that for a few years and I loved it. Um, but what I loved about it was not the part on the investing side. I really loved hanging out with the entrepreneurs and figuring out that blank sheet of paper and identifying a market and building a team and um, all those types of things that are involved in a startup. What I didn't like was the investment side of things and hanging out with my partners. So I wanted to hang out with the entrepreneurs. Um, so then I went to business school. Um, I graduated in 96, right before that 99 bubble that Gordon was talking about. and. Um, when I was at HBS, I took a lot of entrepreneurial courses. There weren't that many at the time. Uh, it's a much more robust department now, I'm happy to say. Um, but those were the, the classes that interested me. And I was one of a handful of my classmates that actually took a job in a startup. At that time, uh, sad to say 15 years ago, it was unusual not to take a job in a consulting firm or investment bank or a large corporation. And uh, my classmates laughed at me because I took a huge pay cut. Uh, but I went to work for a startup, um, and you know, again, I had no idea I wanted to be an entrepreneur, but I knew I, what I didn't want to do. And all those interviews at the 
investment banks and the consulting firms, I just could not bring myself to take one of those jobs. So I knew there was something different about me. And you know, in hindsight, I realized I, I came from an entrepreneurial family. I didn't realize it at the time, but my parents um, owned a hotel and restaurant in Vermont. And um, you know, they controlled their own destiny. They dealt with limited resources. They grew something from nothing to something, and then they sold it. So, you know, looking back with hindsight, I realized that I did have entrepreneurship in my genes, and uh, there was something about me that these more conventional jobs just didn't appeal. So I took a job in a startup and um, learned a ton. Um, I, I've since done about half a dozen startups, mostly in the technology space, uh, starting with the internet at the early stages of the internet and then moving over to mobile when the internet got too mature and wasn't as interesting to me. Um, my first company was called iMarket. It was sold to Dun & Bradstreet. It was originally a CD-ROM software company and we transformed it into a web company. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about that in my lessons learned. The second company was called Plan It All, sold to Amazon for 100 million in 1998. Again, thanks to the bubble, luck and timing. Uh, had a lot to do with that, I can't take a lot of credit. And um, my third one was Hotel Luxury. Oh no, third one was Send.com, which was originally SendWine.com, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. Um, and then I did Hotel Luxury, which is a, um, a website that built um, uh, portals for luxury boutique hotels to sell their furniture. And uh, then I did a mobile company called Mobitious, which then transformed to Snap My Life. And again, I'm setting the stage to uh, talk, talk to you about um, what I learned from all these. And then the, um, the last one, I, I had five startups where I was not a founder. I was one of those people that joined startups at a very early stage. I was usually the first, one of the first five employees. Um, part of the management team, and I was not the idea person. I was the entrepreneur, the one that liked to execute, as Gordon was alluding to earlier. And then my last one that I did before joining the iLab staff was um, where I was a co-founder, and that was called Drink, and it was a mobile app for wine. Um, so where is the clicker thing? Um, so again, no data to support any of my lessons learned. I, um, I'm just sharing with you with hindsight being 2020, things that I've learned from my mistakes and my successes, um, I have to say that um, you know one of my slides is "Don't be afraid to fail." I've learned so much more from my failures than I have my successes, um, and uh, you know a lot of the successes uh, were luck and timing. So um, you know I can't take credit for all of those, but um, uh, I'll share with you some of my learnings. So. You know, the first one, and you know, Gordon talked about the idea and innovation and commercialization. I'm a really firm believer that it's not about the idea. It certainly helps to have a great idea. Um, and if you have an idea that's gonna transform the world, um, all the power to you. But mo more often than not, um, you don't have that great idea. Um, and what I've realized that it, the idea doesn't have to be brilliant. Just do it better, do it cheaper, do it faster, do it, somehow improve upon the way it's being done now. Um, and you know, there's a lot of that, that that you'll see in my slides that's very similar. But um, you know, try to innovate in a way that does something that's already being done, but do it better. Um, most of my startups change their original idea anyway. I had a company that was sendwine.com, and it was uh, wine gifts. And we morphed into send.com. And it was a completely different business model, and we became a giant gift company. And the reason I joined the company originally is because I liked wine. Um, but you know, you morph your idea morphs to, um, because of the market. It morphs because you can't raise money. It, you know, whatever it might be, Send.com happened to be uh, resonated with the investors. They thought it was going to be a bigger market cap, and we own that URL. And they thought, let's be Send.com. So the idea is going to morph. Um, Mobitious was another one. It was a mobile app. Um, it was a, a way to index mobile apps before the App Store even existed. We were way too early to market. We realized that uh, we were creating a market that didn't exist, and that's a really hard thing to do, and I'll talk about that later. And we morphed into Snap My Life, which was a mobile photo sharing site. So completely different idea than what originally uh, we had intended to. And just, you know, <laughs> Google. They didn't have a great idea. There were a million search sites out there. And they said, you know what? We're going to create a search site that doesn't suck. 
We want to do it better than everyone else. They didn't invent a new market and look at where they are today. So my first lesson and my first words of wisdom is you don't have to have the big idea. The second one is a follow on to that, that it really is all about the people. It's about execution. And if you have the right team and you execute well, you can work with just about any idea. Um, you know, <laughs> and this is, you know, sounds kind of silly, but good people can fix bad ideas, but good ideas can't fix bad people. So I highly recommend you start with a great team. Um, it's a marriage. Uh, I've had a lot of these things go horribly wrong because we didn't choose each other wisely. I also recommend don't do it alone. Have a co-founder. It's lonely and it's hard. Um, at the same time, don't have 10 co-founders because then it makes it really hard to split up the company and figure out who's in charge. Um, have those difficult conversations early. When you do have co-founders, make sure that the equity splits and the corporate structure is ironed out very early on. And a lot of times, you know, you're, you're partnering with friends and classmates and people that you trust and you believe in and you don't think it's going to be an issue and you have a conversation. Um, but things can get ugly and things can change. Um, so work all that out early. But to me, it's all about the people and start with a great team. The next one is, and I think Gordon alluded to this too earlier on, make something that customers want to buy. Um, a lot of my startups were creating a new market that didn't exist, and it's a lot harder um, when there's not an actual market that you're playing in. Um, and all companies are gonna fail if they don't create something that customers want. I think Brent had that in his uh, lessons learned. Um, and then the other thing is, and particularly now in this day and age, it's so easy to launch something and get customer feedback, um, even if it's not in the technology industry. Um, but try to validate your concept and validate your market really early on before you spend a lot of time and money doing what you're doing. Um, and then, again, you know, like I said, most of my companies, we pivoted and we changed our strategy and ultimately what the company does um, as we realize that either there wasn't a customer, there wasn't a market, or no one was willing to buy it. Um, so be willing to change. Don't be so stuck with your original idea. Listen to people, get lots of feedback, and then be willing to pivot. Um, and then here's my really big one. And again, hindsight being 2020, I learned so much about this focus. Keep it simple. Don't try to be everything to everyone. Um, Make sure it's a really easy thing to explain to people what you do. If your friend's asking you what you're doing with your company and, and what does it do, if you can't explain it, um, you know, something might be wrong. Um, and don't try to take over the world. You know, pick a small market, a niche market, and do things really well. Um, you know, you can always grow and you can always expand into other markets, but make sure you have a, a, an idea that resonates with a particular market space. Um, again, this is, is similar to the other one, but don't reinvent the wheel. Um, opportunities for disruption are everywhere. Build a business in an existing market. Try to do it better, cheaper. Um, another lesson learned, um, again, just through my personal experiences, start at the low end of the market. You know, it's a lot easier to make a cheap product better and move up the market than to start at the top end and make a powerful product cheaper and to come down. So start with something simple, start with something easy, and then work your way up. Um, and here's another big one. You know, a lot of times I, I had lots of really great ideas that I thought were really great ideas that no one else was doing. And then I spent a few months researching it and writing a business plan and talking to investors and realized that there was a reason why there was no one else doing it and there was no competition. Uh, I love competition. If I go into a market and there's no one else in it, you know, they must, someone must know something that I don't know. Um, competition validates your industry. Um, my, my mobile app, wine, uh, Drink Wine, when we first started, uh, there weren't a lot of competitors. There were a couple, and um, we had a really hard time uh, talking to investors and validating the concept. And uh, we launched in the App Store. There were about five of them. And then, and then about six months later, there were probably 20 different wine apps. I think there's 60 now. 
the more competitors we had, the easier it was to have those investor conversations and to talk about why we were different and what we were doing better than everyone else. If there's no one else to talk about and how you're different from them, um, it's really hard to have those conversations. So I like competition. Um, Gordon also alluded to this, the whole, um, do you want to be rich or do you want to be king? This is another big thing for me. Um, I've seen a lot of my co-founders go down the wrong path because they didn't want to give up the equity. Um, it, <laughs> you know, you'd rather own less of something that's worth a lot than all of something that's worth nothing. Uh, my company, Planet All, that was sold to Amazon, um, we uh, had a lot of equity starting out. Um, and uh, we had investors, and we brought on a management team, and we had to dilute a lot of our equity and give up a lot of equity. And in the end, we sold to Amazon for $100 million. And you know, I don't think if we didn't do all of that, that the company would have been worth anything. So um, you know, in the end, it was the right thing to do. Um, someone also told me this, trade stock for something that improves your chances of success. So bring in investors, co-founders, employees, um, anyone who you think is going to increase your likelihood of success, trade stock for that. Um, you know, I think it's going to be the, the, the best way to go in the end. Um, and this is the other thing about the passion part. Uh, you can't do it for the money. I mean, there's so many people, you look at the successes and you look at um, Facebook and you know, all, all these companies that have had successes and they're, they're the anomaly. They're the, the minority that succeed. Um, you got to do it because you love it, you believe in what you're doing, you're passionate about it. Um, it's always going to cost a lot more and take a lot longer than you ever imagined uh, and be so much harder. And you know, as Gordon said, it's lonely and it's hard. Um, so you got to love what you, you, you're doing and you got to do it for that reason only, not for the big win. Um, the, the other thing, again, I think this goes back to the ego issue um, that Gordon also alluded to, but you know, be confident, not arrogant. You know, you're going to be hit with rejection left and right and people saying that your idea is terrible. Um, so you have to be confident. You have to be, um, you know, have conviction with your idea. But at the same time, you have, you know, humility is important. And you know, you can say, I don't know. And when you talk to investors or you talk to people who uh, are mentors or advisors, don't pretend that you know everything. I mean, they're there to help you. And um, I think <laughs> to be humble and to ask questions, it, it makes a much better entrepreneur. Um, but you know, at the same time, you know, be willing to fight for what you believe in, and you're going to get. Um, People saying no, and it's a stupid idea over and over again, and you have to believe that it's not and keep going in the face of rejection. Um, but at the same time, you know, I, I've seen the egos get in the way and people who are afraid to admit when they're wrong and afraid to change their idea or pivot when um, they're getting a lot of feedback in that direction, and it's ruined a lot of companies. So I think you have to be confident but be open to um, listening to feedback from people who uh, are experts in the area. Um, and then the last one, as I said earlier, is you know, don't be afraid to fail. Again, I learned so much more from my failures and my successes. I didn't make as much money, but um, I think it made me a better person. And um, you know, most of them are going to fail. You're gonna, you got to do it again because you love it. Um, you you got to enjoy the process, and you got to be doing it because you love to do it. And um, you know, assume that it's probably going to fail and hope that, uh, hope that you succeed. Um, so with that, I think we're going to start talking about um, what the iLab can offer you. Um, again, this is my personal experience, my laundry list of lessons learned um, with the uh, 15 years of entrepreneurial experience I've had, and I'm happy to talk to anyone uh, on a one-on-one -on -one basis uh, going forward. And you know, this, all of this background uh, that I've talked about brought me to brought me here today um, and what drew me to the iLab is that I love entrepreneurship. And I'm one of those people, I think, you know, according to Gordon's data, I like the really early stage. I like the idea and figuring out what you want to do. Um, and as soon as the company gets big and you need a management team and I had people reporting to me and a job description, I was no longer interested. 
So the stage at which um, all of you guys are at and all of our iLab teams are at is, is my favorite stage. And I love helping companies get off the ground. Um, and that's why I came here. Um, and I'm really excited about what the iLab has to offer. And uh, we're just getting started ourselves. As Gordon said, we're a startup. Um, but we've got a lot of great programming and a lot of interesting um, resources that can help entrepreneurs get started. So what do you have here? Do you want to get up and yeah. talk with me? Um, so the first things first, um, the iLab itself. I don't know if, if you guys have all spent time here or been inside the iLab. Uh, 30,000 square feet of space. People can come and use it on a day use basis as long as you're a current Harvard student and are working on an idea. And you can utilize all the resources that we have. Um, we also have, should I get into the programming stuff or do we want yeah, um, to flip the to the program. next one? Why don't you talk about the, the programming that you've worked on? Because I'm, a, and then, and, and then we can talk about how people, actually I'm going to have Kate talk about ways people can get connected. Okay, talk about perfect. the programming. Okay, so um, we have the space and you can use it on a day use uh, basis. We also have a residency program where you can apply for dedicated space on a semester basis to work on your idea. This is for teams that are a little more well formed, they've been working on their idea for a while, they could benefit from dedicated space and the community that's associated with that. And you could apply for that uh, each semester and uh, we currently have about 75 teams working out of here, and um, it's, uh, it's a really great way to get entrenched in the entrepreneurial community at the iLab. From a programming standpoint, uh, the workshops are a really great way uh, to get involved. If you don't have an idea, you're just interested in entrepreneurship, we offer uh, 25 to 30 workshops a semester on all phases of entrepreneurship, very hands-on skill building, as Gordon said before. I bring in entrepreneurs from the outside, investors, lawyers who all work in the startup field to teach you about entrepreneurship. And uh, you can go to our website and find out about uh, all those different workshops. We also have office hours. We have experts and residents who conduct office hours and have one-on-one -on -one meetings with students that um, you are more than welcome to utilize if you want to toss around an idea or you're working on a venture and want some expert advice and um, we have amazing experts and residents from all the different schools, from different schools represented, as well as experts in uh, individual fields uh, like venture capitalists and lawyers. Um, we also have a mentorship program, and again, this is for vent, uh, students who have ventures that are a little further along and can benefit from that uh, ongoing relationship with a mentor. And uh, you can sign up to have a mentor assigned to you uh, to work with you throughout the semester and beyond. And then there's all sorts of other um, amazing opportunities to get involved. There's a startup scramble that's coming up next weekend, not this weekend. And it's a way for students who are either looking to join a team or have an idea and want to pull together a team. Um, we have challenges that uh, uh, you can form a team and um, compete for uh, resources and uh, monetary rewards. And uh, what am I forgetting? There's all sorts of other one-off events. We have immersion events. There's, um, there's January term trips you can apply for. We've got a trip going to Silicon Valley. These are faculty-led trips. Really interested if you've got an idea you want to pursue that Silicon Valley is the right destination. The other is we're going to New York City for the more of a cultural entrepreneurship theme. So the arts, food, um, fashion, design, media, if those are areas of interest, we know New York is a real hot spot for that kind of activity, so that's also an opportunity. And then one thing I also forgot to mention, you know, I spent my, almost my entire <laughs> entrepreneurial career joining startups. We also do a startup career fair in early February for students who are looking to join a startup that don't necessarily want to start a company on their own. Uh, these are all companies that are actively hiring for internships and full-time employment. Um, and so that's a really great way to um, figure out if you want to be an entrepreneur. Let me, let me also add, too, um, from a different angle, we've had a chance this last academic year to really see there's really three areas of student interest that ideas and teams form around. And we've, we are organizing as we continue to grow as a startup around those three areas. And we, um, one of them is social and cultural entrepreneurship. There's a lot of students who have uh, ideas that generally fit under this, whether they be education related, they may be 
social justice, they may be, um, you name it, a lot of different ideas and teams. Secondary health and sciences. We have a number of teams that have been in residence that um, are looking around either diagnostics or uh, more bringing healthcare into the home. Um, there is some more, more heavy science involved, the VAXIS being one. Some of these spin out of courses. The third area is what we're calling more tech or consumer. It's really anything from mobile, web, physical goods and services. It's just it's a clustering we do as we think about programming, but it typically has a consumer in mind, some end user that you're looking to aggregate lots of individuals together. And these practice areas, you're gonna find some of the workshops that Jody's put together are a little more tailored towards one of those three than others, although a good number are also intentionally designed for any practice area. We think what we're building here is trying to be a resource that's university-wide, that's both the programming but also this facility where we believe in the strength of these three areas, actually intermingling and being around each other. And we've talked a lot about, forget the programming we're doing, the stuff that happens when we're not doing programming, where students are meeting each other, um, in the break area, people are meeting each other at workshops. I can't tell you the number of stories we've seen um, and heard of where people are like, I met someone I never would have met at this university, and we both now are working on a project together. Or this person really, you know, I, I, one of the ones I've talked about a lot was I had a student from the EDLD program in the ed school here working with two, two college students who had a financial services startup, and they had a charitable component that was meant to support schools that they'd half-baked and a lot of their customers were really interested in it. And if it wasn't for that EDLD student from the ed school who sat down, she'd been at New Schools Ventures before, um, if you know Beth Rabbit, and, and Beth in a half an hour had unlocked for these students a whole new way. Uh, they were thrilled, their customers were happy. Um, not that this has to be the end of the story, but that team rolled out with venture funding in the, in the low millions to now go commercialize that idea. And, and those two students all agreed we never would have bumped into each other if it weren't for the kind of convening ability that a place like the iLab has. So part of this is just about getting into the game too. Jump in. The other thing we missed was faculty are teaching courses here. <laughs> and that's very foundational and a lot of students meet each other that way too. So workshops by night, courses that are taught. We've had, I think this term, eight different courses from six different Harvard schools faculty teaching courses that have to do with entrepreneurship or innovation in their disciplines. So intentionally it may be a little bit feeling like, oh my gosh, there's all, you know, how do they all fit together? You know what? We're a marketplace. We're not an, we're not an escalator, we're a jungle gym. <laughs> and you know, get ready to climb on that jungle gym, but it requires you to also actually move, move along. And it's a very participatory journey. And you know what? I wouldn't have it any other way. Because if you're going to be an entrepreneur, if there's one thing you've hopefully heard Jody and myself talk about, is it requires you to be willing to go through obstacles in this journey. You're going to face them. Everybody's going to face them. So it would be unfair of us to set up such a friction-free environment that you felt like, wow, this is pretty easy. It's kind of fun. You know, you guys really take good care of us. Or, you know, we want to make it something where you have to kind of make choices. But there's a lot of resources we do think we pull together for you. And as Gordon said earlier, our mission's really simple, to help students take their ideas as far as they can go. You know, our job, again, we have no ulterior motives. We're not, we're not like an accelerator or an incubator or we don't take equity, we don't charge rent. We're here to support you and increase your likelihood of success. We want to unlock the resources of the university and unlock the resources of the greater entrepreneurial ecosystem for you. And you know, I, I like to tell people, I, we want to give you a, an unfair competitive advantage. We want to make sure that you succeed and resource you in every way possible. And that's what all of the programming is set up to do. But as Gordon said um, so well, it's also the, the intangible, the, the, the secret sauce to this space, I think, is the interactions among all of you and facilitating those interactions. So we want to create opportunities for you to find each other and pull together teams that'll ultimately uh, be successful. Let me introduce Kate Range. Um, she's the fourth member of our team. She works with Neil in operations. Kate is um, the number one fan of many students. She's certainly <laughs> one of our biggest, uh, we're certainly biggest fans of hers. Um, Kate is someone you will see a lot if you choose to spend time here. Um, Kate is someone you can ask any question at any time of day when you're here. And we've asked her to just kind of walk you through 
really practically the last slide we have, which is how do I get connected? Okay, thanks Jody and Gordon. <laughs> what can I actually do? What are you recommending as my next step? So let me turn it over to you. You've got a handheld mic. Am I, on, am I live? All right. Yep, and just walk people through. <laughs> All right. Um, so I am part of the operations team with Neil, who couldn't make it tonight, but um, I want to talk to you about how to get involved practically. So the first thing I would tell you to do is sign up for the newsletter. Um, the link is on the slide. It's also the far right tab on our uh, web page. And that's going to be delivered to your inbox the latest and most updated events, EIR appointments, legal office hour appointments, um, events going around Boston. And it's just a lot of information that I think is, is really good way to digest what we're doing on a weekly basis. Um, you can also like us on Facebook. We have a Facebook page. Um, and follow us on Twitter. Neil is daily tweeting and updating and sending out more kind of fun pics and information. Um, so events that we put on that I really think are helpful for students, um, according to the feedback we get, are workshops. Um, so every Tuesday and Thursday, 6 to 8, uh, you probably registered for this event. So there are other Eventbrite pages. Um, and so check out on our iLab events calendar, which is also on the web page. You can go um, just browse through everything and uh, register for events that interest you. Um, so in, like Jody said, in a, a week and a half, we have the Startup Scramble, which is going to be an all-weekend event um, where students with ideas pitch and students who want to join a team can pick an idea. Um, and then at the end of the weekend, hopefully some teams have formed and some progress has been made on some ventures. And I think it's really exciting. I'm really looking forward to it. And uh, you can check it out also on our webpage. Um, so something near and dear to my heart is the President's Challenge, which is um, an initiative we ran in the spring semester of this past year for social entrepreneurship. We dispersed $150,000 of funding to um, student teams who addressed one of five global issues. Um, this was my project, it's my baby, and um, we're gonna be running it again this year, getting a little bit earlier start, so stay tuned. There will be more info on the website as well. And um, there are lots of clubs around the university that uh, maybe are particular to a school, particular to your school, that are focused on entrepreneurship and innovation. Um, so look at those club listings as well, and they're gonna have different information, um, hopefully, you know, talk about what we do here as well. Um, but, you know, it's a good way to connect with people in your school. Uh, so, so check those out as well. Okay, let me add, let me add to this because I think this is also, the other point here is there's a lot of club activity that ha happens here in the iLab. We are an extension. When I started this, I talked about 10 schools. There's 10 deans that I report to. We really consider ourselves an extension of your campus. Um, we're not, we are cross-governed in this university. You are, you, your ID gets you in the door here. And I want you to feel that sense of an extension of your campus. Because a lot of clubs, as, as Kate has referenced, there's a lot of club meetings that'll happen down here that are intentionally open to broader audiences than just the school whose club that club comes from. So there's a lot of programming that you may hear about that doesn't hit our calendar. But we, again, we view ourselves as a node in the network. So we're presenting a lot of the programming we serve up, but we very much support a lot of these clubs. And so that's why we put it up here. It's a great way to get into the unofficial current that works within the iLab. And if you're looking for names of clubs you're not sure, come ask Kate or Jody or myself, and we can certainly give you some ideas as well. So back to you. Okay. Um, so also what I think students find really helpful um, is sitting down with an expert. Uh, we have experts in residence and we also have legal office hours with lawyers. These are half hour appointments, they're free. You can go in with a problem that you're having and get individualized specific advice. Um, you can always email me for those appointments. As I said earlier, they're also on our newsletter. So that's even more incentive to open up that newsletter when it comes in to get an appointment. Um, and if you're already on a team and, and you're looking for a way to move forward, I would suggest you apply for long-term residency in the spring. Those applications will open up later in the semester. Um, so we have about 70, 65, 70 teams per term who move in, um, meet other teams, work on their ventures, and take full advantage of our resources. Um, even if you're not part of a team and, and you don't feel ready for residency, I would say the most important thing is to come here you know, come work out of here because there are inc incredible connections that are happening organically 
in the kitchen, people sharing ideas as they you know, open a bag of almonds and talk about how great it is to have free Fritos and coffee. So really, you know, come down here, meet other students, and share your ideas. All right. Thank you. So that really is a wrap on Entrepreneurship 101.